Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You're probably familiar that one of the very last things that Jesus ever said was exactly that. Father, forgive them. In tonight's lesson, the ninth lesson in this Build Below the Baseline series, we're going to look at exactly that, that word of forgiveness. Now, if you happen to miss any of the previous lessons leading up to this ninth lesson on forgiveness, uh, I'd implore you to go to the archive section, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, and you can catch back up in the series. This series has been such a great look at what it takes to build the most important part of our lives, and that is the foundation. The foundation is the most important structure in any building that you'll ever see. And likewise, it is the most important thing in our spiritual life is to have a steady foundation. If you have your Bibles uh, with you, and I hope you do, uh, maybe a Bible app, and I hope you have a notepad or something to take notes with, stay engaged with the lesson. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 and looking at some very familiar passages of Scripture tonight as we talk about that thing of forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is something that we can very easily say. I have young children in my home, and when one of them wrongs the other one, um, I will say, hey, tell them you're sorry. And they'll say sorry. And very quickly, the other one will say, I forgive you. Now, sometimes we, say, we use those words, I forgive you, but really we haven't forgiven that person in our heart. Forgiveness is something that many times that we cannot see, but that it eventually it will come out whether we actually do or do not forgive another. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole still no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. If I can go back to those words that I spoke when we first came on, of Father forgives them. We know that forgiveness was a very attribute of Jesus himself, and it's an attribute of God as well. And the Bible here tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that we are to forgive even as God, and, and through Christ Jesus and by Christ and for his sake, has forgiven us. In this lesson, once again, we're going to talk about this essential area of the Christian life. It is not just essential uh, to the fact of our relationship with God, but it's a, a essential to having strong relationships, period. And whether that's a relationship with a family member, a relationship with your spouse, a relationship with a friend or acquaintance or fe fellow church member, it's that thing of forgiveness. All of us in this life will eventually, if you have not already, or already have experienced hurt by others. What we do with that hurt will truly determine if we are strengthening our foundation or weakening our foundation. Bitterness is one of the greatest hidden sins that, that a Christian can have. And it is one of the, the hidden sins that has destroyed many a great Christians and many a great churches. But yet, on the other hand, forgiveness is also one of the greatest restorers of relationships. And it brings freedom into the life of a Christian to be able to forgive and instead of hold on to that and to dwell in bitterness. One of the most famous stories that we can tell of forgiveness outside of Jesus himself were the missionaries Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. Maybe you've heard of them before. Maybe this is your first time that you've ever heard of them before. Uh, they were called by the Lord to go to the Aka Indians. And, and I, won't, I won't waste our time with all the, the intricate stories of um, how, they, how they got there. I, I, I would implore you to, to go read a little bit about Jim Elliott and Elizabeth Elliott's story. It's a wonderful story uh, of God's grace and forgiveness and how forgiveness can work in the heart of another. But after a seemingly very friendly first contact 
with these Indians. Jim and his team, they go into the Indians themselves, and the Indians take their lives. Elizabeth and her 10-month-old daughter were, were left, obviously, without Jim. People often asked Elizabeth as, you know, how, how she would handle this thing. She, in turn, actually went back to those very same people. They lived with the tribe. They taught the tribe. They won many of the Aka Indians to Christ. And, they, and they, 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 they asked, how could you ever forgive this group that murdered your husband? Her response was striking. He said, to the world at large, this was a sad waste of five young lives, the five members of this team. But God has his plan and purpose in all things. The prayers of the widows themselves are for the Akas. We look forward to the day when these savages will join us in Christian praise. This kind of response was only possible because Elizabeth Elliot had built forgiveness in the baseline of her Christian life. And they were able to do a marvelous work with the Aka Indians. Once again, I, I, I would challenge you to, to read about that. But relationships in Christian homes and churches are often destroyed by this very thing of unforgiveness, an unforgiving spirit. Someone who has nurtured an unforgiving spirit in their home or in their church home is certain to face destruction because of that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 through 32, really gives us a pattern in our Christian life for how to deal with the hurts of life and as well as having a, for, a forgiving spirit. In this lesson, we'll see four specific ways that we can respond with forgiveness. The first way is we need to reject Satan's temptation. Reject his temptation. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. You know, the devil has many different ways that he can attack us. He has many different darts and arrows that he will shoot at us. But one of his favorite arrows to use against a Christian is a hurt spirit, a wounded spirit. In our most vulnerable moments of pain, he tempts us to respond and not a helpful way, but rather the most unhelpful way. And that is anger. And so the first thing that we have to do is we have to reject Satan's temptation. We do that by two, and, and a lot of ways that we, we, he, he gets us is to sin and anger. Once again, that verse says, be angry and sin not. James 1.20 tells us, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. It is true that this verse does tell us that it is possible to have a righteous indignation, a righteous anger against sin. However, this is never a, an excuse to have anger against another. It is true that, that Jesus himself demonstrated anger. We, we know that. We can see that. It, uh, the, our book here uh, that we're going through gives us one instance that he is angry at the sinfulness of, of, of the religious. However, his anger was only ever directed at sin. And it caused him to uphold, once again, his righteousness because he was never angry at another. He was not angry because somebody had violated his very personal rights. In fact, Jesus himself allowed his personal uh, rights to be taken from him freely. You know, we, we sometimes think that our hurt that leads us to anger is acceptable because it is in response to somebody doing us wrong. However, this verse is not giving us a pass to remain angry at another. The Bible, famous Bible commentator Matthew Henry said, if we would be angry and not sin, we must be angry at nothing but sin. And we should be more jealous for the glory of God than for any interest or reputation of our own. This is the exact kind of anger that Jesus himself displayed. It wasn't, he wasn't angry because his feelings had been hurt. He was simply ang angry at sin. We are angry because many times our feelings are hurt. We are angry because we feel as though our rights have been violated. We are angry because we feel as though maybe our efforts have been left unrecognized. This very simply could also be a form of pride. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Benjamin Franklin uh, once said that whatever is begun in anger ends in shame. Ends in shame. And one of the ways 
that the devil would have us to be tempted in this and how we must reject Satan's temptation is to sin in anger. But also it is to stay in anger. This is why he, it says, Ephesians 4.26, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. God commands us to not allow our anger to linger. One of the best um, things that we could ever learn in our family is, and you've probably heard it before, I know I've heard it several times, is to not go to bed angry. And that is a that is certainly a, 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 a good lesson to learn. And, and But it here, says here, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What is wrath? Wrath is defined as intense anger. It often has the idea of vengeance behind this anger. It is when we are angry, and therefore, we want to make somebody pay for the way that they have hurt us. I, I know I have been there. Many of you watching have also been there. And, and the, the, who else recognizes that we're angry is also Satan himself. Satan will recognize anger, and that as long as we are angry at someone, he'll understand that we will be immobilized spiritually. The Bible gives us several examples. In fact, Jesus in his very famous Sermon on the Mount tells us that if we are to have aught with our brother, and I'm paraphrasing here, and the Bible, he goes so far as to say, look, leave your offerings there at the altar. First go make it right with your brother. Then come again, and then you can make it right with God. He, Satan understands that this thing of unforgiveness, that's this thing that lets uh, it... it it, it simmer and, and continue into bitterness is something that will immobilize you spiritually. We must not stay in anger. We should never be too proud to do what is necessary to not end our day in, in, in anger or discord amongst somebody in our home. We, if we let it go way too easy and lay our head on that pillow and right beside us is our spouse and we are angry one with another, we have done our home a disservice, and we have immobilized spirituality in our home and, and therefore are not honoring God with our relationship with our husband and wife or our relationship with our children. We must not end the day in anger. God wants us to address problems graciously instead of harboring these hurts and becoming bitter. He, he gives us a warning in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. It says, Looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You know, if we are to take Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 15 to heart, we have to understand that, Lord, I'm going to have to ask the Holy Spirit. Lord, or Holy Spirit, will you, would you show me and point it out to me and not let me get out, not, not, not let, let me go to bed with, with me harboring this bitterness? Would you show it to me and point it out to me so that I can get it right? Ephesians 4.27 uh, tells us to neither give place to the devil. Now look, I believe... For the majority of you watching this lesson, the reason you're watching this lesson is you want to grow closer to God. And therefore, you probably would not willingly give any sort of space in your life to the devil. But when we allow anger to infiltrate our lives and unforgiveness to permeate our being, we have given a spot and influence to the devil in our lives. Why? Because it is a tool and a device that he uses to, to, to make us uh, um, ill-equipped to serve the Lord. We have to understand. You know, Paul himself recognized that the devil uses unforgiveness to gain an advantage against us. He mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, 10 and 11 it says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. One of his devices is this thing of anger and unforgiveness. Marriages and homes and friendships that fall apart, they don't do so overnight. They, they, it happens in many cases. There are, are, are several nights uh, of, of unchecked bitterness, unchecked anger, unchecked wrath. And it happens when we let the sun go down without getting it right. We must reject the temptation, Satan's temptation, to sin in anger and to stay in anger. God has a better way for us. 
and he offers us the grace to do it. So secondly, the first thing, we're rejecting uh, the, the tem Satan's temptation. Secondly, we are reflecting biblical grace. We are reflecting biblical grace. When someone wrongs us, what is our typical response? I know what my typical response is. Our typical response is to respond in vengeance and anger, right? But if we are to reflect biblical grace, the way that we're supposed to respond is an opportunity to receive the grace of God and thereby reflect it to someone else. Ephesians chapter 4 gives us two ways that we can do so. The first way is in our actions. In our actions, verse number 28 of chapter 4 says, Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give him that needeth. Now, in this verse, we see a, a few phrases and really they're word pictures. The first one is stealing. Stealing here is being used as a parallel word picture of who we are when we do not reflect God's grace and we remain in anger. You say, well, what does that have to do with anger and stealing? Well, stealing and unforgiveness both disregard the Holy Spirit. And, and, and in that, uh, it, 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 it rejects God's command for grace. And additionally, what, what is stealing? I, I think stealing and thieving is one of the great, greatest form of, forms of pride that there is. And uh, I, my, my vehicle, uh, maybe several of you have, have uh, uh, experienced this, um, has been broken into and someone goes and they take things out of your vehicle and, and man, you just, it just feels very violating. And, and it's unsettling that somebody would come into your space and do something of that nature. And why would someone do that? Many times it, 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 it is a great form of pride, believing that, that, they, that someone deserves something that they don't have that another person has and therefore they're simply going to take it. Well, anger is also a form of pride. It is believing that I should be treated a, a, a different way than I currently am being treated. It thinks that we're above being wrong, that we're above being hurt. But, but yet, God, God never promised that we wouldn't be hurt. In fact, he promised that we would have trials. He promised that we would have persecution. But yet, he tells us that we must forgive. God tells us that instead of, uh, of using our actions uh, to hurt another in vengeance, we ought to give grace to others. And so the first way is in our actions is how I'm going to reflect grace. The second way that I reflect grace is in, in our words. In our words, verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That word corrupt means rotten, uh, putrefied, unfit for use. And when we hold unforgiveness in our heart, it will always eventually come out of our mouth. It may take a little bit of time before it does, but it's going to eventually come out. Eventually our bitterness will spill out and it will defile us and it will defile many. James chapter 3 verse 10 says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursing. cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? And, and, and so we have to understand that the, the way that I use my, my words is for the use of edifying, is what the Bible says. And that word edifying means to cause to grow. And, and you know, we live in a culture today, especially in, in the day and age of social media, it is so very easy to tear someone down. And uh, we, we, we just with a click of a button, we can take our phone, throw it out there, and, and tear somebody down. I, I'm, I am guilty of it as well. But that is not how, James says that these things ought not to be so. We ought to use our words to build somebody up. We ought to use our words to edify and to, and to help someone to grow in grace. That is how we reflect the grace that has been given to us. We must learn to respond to the difficulties that we face in biblical grace. Thirdly, we have to refuse to grieve the Holy Spirit. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to resist the devil's temptation. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect God's grace. The third thing we must do is to refuse to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, 
whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know something that grieves God? Bitterness grieves God. It grieves God. Verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. So let's define those three words. What is bitterness? Bitterness means extreme en enmity, grudge, or hatred. Wrath means fierce rage. Anger means blowing up with violent emotion. These three often go together in our lives. They are sins that tend to just feed each other. And it's like fire and fuel. It just The fuel just feeds this fire of bitterness and wrath and anger. And usually when we are allowing them in our life, or in our lives, we feel justified in doing so. Why? Because somebody's wronged us. But yet God commands us that those are the very three things that ought to be put away from our life. Now, me as both hands raised as guilty of having these things, of bitterness and wrath and anger, knows that nothing good can come from it. We, we, we talked about that at the beginning. But we have to understand that bitterness grieves God. Sinful speech grieves God. Ephesians 4.31, let all clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. The first three things we, we looked at, the first three sins, bitterness, wrath, and anger, they relate primarily to how we feel, right? That is a feeling, bitterness, wrath, anger. The last three that we're talking about here are primarily dealing with what we say. Clamor means a great outcry, uh, to utter loud noises repeatedly. Evil speaking means to slander. To, 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 to try to injure someone's, another's good name. Malice means all that is sinful. You notice the process here that is being exposed? In, in, in Ephesians 31, the issue begins in the heart as bitterness, and, and bitterness grieves God, and then it fans the flames to our emotions of wrath and anger, and, and, the, and that, those things begin to spill out. And eventually, as bitterness boils inside, what we say is exposed through our speech about another. This is clamor and evil speaking. An unknown author once said, and this is such a wise saying, unforgiveness is the poison that we drink, hoping another dies. Unforgiveness is the poison that we drink, hoping the other dies. Those things that spill out eventually are things that grieve God. Let's not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is, is, is by far, in my opinion, the most abused part of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He is with us every day. He, is, he, he will never forsake us. And yet we willingly bring these things into our life that grieves him. We need his ministry to us. Let's not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And then lastly, we're going to reflect the Savior's forgiveness. We're going to reflect the Savior's forgiveness. How can I have forgiveness? How can I build forgiveness in my life? First, I need to reject Satan's temptation. Secondly, I need to reflect, uh, the, I need to reflect God's grace. Thirdly, I, I must realize that in order to have forgiveness, that, that not only do I need to reflect his grace, I, I, and by the way, which is a biblical grace, which is his grace, not, not my own perceived grace, but I also need to uh, refuse the Holy Spirit. And so then lastly, I'm going to reflect the Savior's forgiveness. God doesn't just tell us what not to do. I'm glad he tells us what not to do, but he gives us the perfect remedy for forgiveness, for, for bitterness. What is the perfect remedy for bitterness? It is choosing forgiveness. Our having a forgiving spirit is to be a reflection of God's forgiveness towards us. What can we remember in order to do that? The first thing that we ought to remember in, in reflecting the Savior's forgiveness is that we serve a kind Savior. We serve a kind Savior. This very famous verse in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, is what the Bible says. We serve a kind Savior. What does that word kind mean? It means having tenderness or goodness 
of nature benevolent. Tenderhearted means having strong inward compassion, sympathetic. And we do. We serve a kind and tenderhearted Savior who knows our needs. He's sympathetic to our pain. And he is good to us. I, I love when people reflect the kindness of God to another. It's, it's uplifting. It's encouraging. It's edifying. It builds you up. And it builds up someone else. We ought to reflect it through the fact that we serve a kind Savior. Then we reflect it through the fact that we serve a forgiving Savior. A forgiving Savior. Savior. Forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Who hath pardoned you? Who has pardoned your sins? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He chose to forgive us. When we, when we received salvation, we asked him to forgive us of our sins, and he was faithful to do it. He is faithful to forgive. It's very interesting that as Jesus hung on the cross, one of those last words that we already mentioned were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was even as God, even as God, we ought, he forgave. Therefore, we ought to forgive. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Whenever I see myself before God and realize something of what my blessed Lord has done for me at Calvary, I am ready to forgive anybody of anything. I cannot withhold it. I do not even want to withhold it. When others wrong us, God calls us to forgive and to show them kindness. My friend, Romans chapter 12 verse 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And the way that we overcome bitterness and wrath and anger in our life is by doing good. And the doing good is forgiving. Our culture would tell us that forgiveness is an option. And that's usually a bad option. Satan would encourage us to respond to hurt and up by others by hurting others and holding grudges. But the result of this type of living is bitterness and unrest and destruction in our hearts. I hope we choose to not just be merely cultural Christians that follow the fad of today of unforgiveness, but rather that we would choose forgiveness. If we are to be spiritual Christians, we would build this purposely into our lives, a, a life of a forgiving spirit, so that when others see us, especially those who wrong us, they would see Jesus within us by our forgiveness. It Wouldn't that be great today if someone that you know that has hurt you, before you go to bed tonight, you would say, you know what, I forgive you. you say, well, they haven't apologized. You know what, neither did any of these people that were at the foot of the cross. They, they weren't screaming, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he looked down and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's have a forgiving spirit. Have a great week.